John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Well, good morning. Hey, glad you are here. Man, I, I just enjoy these times personally when it's stripped down because for me, it just reminds me of how we started. Um, and a, as much as we grow, as we look for another space, what I never want to forget is where we've come from. Uh, Tove has never been about the space, though it would help. Uh, Tove has never been about the production. Uh, Tove has been about the Word of God empowered by the presence of God pointing to the Son of God for the people of God. Amen? Um, and so, uh, man, it's just a great reminder of even if we get into, when we, not if, when we get into a new space that, man, I, I wish we would have even in those times moments like this where it just takes us back where it's all stripped down and there's no production, just voices and the presence of God. And the question is, is that still enough? I'm saying, yes, it is. It still is. Um, So we are still in Matthew. Uh, We are in week 40. Um, So we are well over two years. So again, congratulations. You've bared through a lot, and we still have a lot to go, but we'll finish. Uh, We are in Matthew chapter 26. We'll be in verses 6 through 16. Uh, And today we're going to see two characters. We're going to see Mary and Judas. One worshiped Jesus and poured out everything as she worshiped Jesus. The other had all of his guts poured out on the field as he betrayed Jesus. Very stark, different realities. Okay? Uh, one worshiped, one betrayed. One was true, one was a faker. Okay? Matthew 26, verse 6 and 7, this is the word of God. It says, now when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask, a very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. So here in Matthew, he's doing a little flashback. As you know, Matthew, unlike Luke, it's not chronological, it's more thematic. So based on John's account of the same story, this was about the this was Saturday before the crucifixion, right? Last Sunday as we talked about the cross, that was Tuesday before the crucifixion. He's going to flashback to Saturday before the crucifixion. Jesus is in a place called Bethany, 2 miles outside of Jerusalem during Passover where the population at this point has swelled over 2 million people out of town visitors for the Passover. And now Bethany, it was, it was a bedroom community during the Passover. People would leave Jerusalem and go to Bethany to find a place to sleep. So Jesus was in Bethany at whose house? Simon the leper's house. So we do know that Simon, this guy, was a leper at one point. It's also safe to assume that this leper has been healed, and Jesus probably, most likely, healed him. However, even him being healed, back in that time, there there was a stigma still attached to these lepers, and the house he's in probably was not a nice house because as a leper, he was excommunicated, so he couldn't work and make money to provide for his family and generate income. So this house was probably not very nice, not very desirable place at all. Um, And back then, too, if you were healed, and if there was still a little bit of leprosy in your house, they would burn down your house, and they would destroy your house. But we will see here, it's not the leper's home that gets destroyed. Actually, it's the temple in 70 AD that will get destroyed, right? The leper's home was more clean than the temple. Jesus received more worship at the leper's home than he did at the temple. Verse 7, let's read that again. A woman came up to him with an alabaster flask, 
a very expensive ointment, not just expensive, very expensive, and she poured it on his head as Jesus reclined at the table. According to John 12, we know that this woman is Mary. Also according to John, this ointment was nard, which is a plant in India, imported from India, and trade was not easy back then. So this was very, very precious and very rare, a year's worth of wages, entire retirement savings that she just poured out on Jesus. Um, This may make you think of the the gifts that the wise men brought to Jesus, gold, which is precious, but hear me, gold you can use again and again and again. This ointment You use it once, and it's gone. So Mary took all of it, poured all of it on Jesus' head, spent a year's worth of wages in one single moment. And here's what's so powerful about this act, about this story. In this moment, friends, hear me. It was all about Jesus. In this moment, it was all for Jesus. Everything was for Jesus. All focus was on Jesus. All adoration was on Jesus. All devotion was on Jesus in this moment. Mary here, she is pouring out her heart, her love, her devotion, her gratitude, all for King Jesus. May we be the same. It is all about Jesus in this moment. In this moment, Jesus is the center of everything she is doing, everything she is thinking. It is all centered, funneled on King Jesus. Jesus, at this moment, he is being lavishly worshipped, something that was not happening at the temple. So my hope and my prayer is that our hearts would be moved for Jesus in the same way, for who he is. Yes, we do operate on duty, but that duty would come from a heart that absolutely adores, has great affection for Jesus. That we come here every Sunday to focus on Jesus, to worship Jesus, to adore Jesus, to praise Jesus, to sing to Jesus. Amen. This is why we are here. It's not about you, friends. It's about Jesus. It's about him. And I think we forget this. Why? Because Jesus deserves it. He deserves all the worship. He deserves all the devotion that we so often give to other things and other people. Verse 8 and 9. And when the disciples, Jesus' dudes, saw this, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. Just virtue signaling everywhere here. Why this waste, Jesus? This could have been used for the poor. The disciples in this moment, they're not getting it. They don't understand. And here, these disciples start resembling who? The Pharisees more than Jesus. The last time we see the word indignant was when the kids were worshiping Jesus at the temple, and it says the Pharisees were indignant. When you're mad about kids worshiping Jesus, you're the problem. Hear me. See how quickly the disciples become like the Pharisees. And hear me. This is for instruction for all of us. You cannot ride on your past faithfulness. Faithfulness at one point is not a guarantee of faithfulness at another point. These were Jesus' picked men, and they at this moment weren't getting it, and they sounded more like the Pharisees than of Jesus. According to, again, the Gospel of John of this story, It was really Judas Iscariot who riled everybody up, the other 11 up, to say, what a waste. We could be feeding the poor and giving to the poor. To be clear, Jesus didn't give a rip about the poor. 
Because up in this point, he is stealing from Jesus' ministry the whole time. It was this one man who whipped up the rest of the 11 to go, go against the woman worshiping Jesus with everything she had. One person can do a lot of damage. Right? Um, it goes on, verse 10 through 13. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. Right, Saturday before the crucifixion. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Right? I mean, do you think it could have been very hurtful for Mary in that moment? I mean, she, in lavish worship of Jesus, gave up everything she had the, the retirement savings, the, the year's worth of wages on Jesus' head, and you have Jesus' right-hand guy saying, what a waste. Right? Hear me, it is hurtful when professing Christians cut you down for your lavish worship of Jesus. Right? Why are you being that? Remember that song, Jesus Freak? Why are you being this? Like, why are you, do, why are you doing that? Like, calm down. Um, hear me. Don't let people like that discourage you. Um, we need more lavish, bold, courageous worshipers of Jesus today. Jesus gets it. Jesus sees it. Jesus understands. Hear me. There is one thing in this life that is more important than anything else. Do you know what that is? Jesus. The right answer is always Jesus. Right. They, the disciples, they at this point, they've lost sight of the most important thing, which is Jesus. Worship of Jesus. Adoration of Jesus. And Jesus says that actually this woman, Mary, what she's doing, she's preparing me for burial. And Mary, in this moment, most likely didn't know that what she was doing was preparing him. All she knew is, I love you. I'm going to worship you. Here's everything I have for you, Jesus. She was passionately worshiping Jesus. And I, I wonder, as Jesus is hanging in the cross, not in, on the cross, a week after, as he's bleeding out, as they're mocking him, as they're spitting on him, Maybe in that moment, as he's in excruciating pain, possibly the one moment, the one reminder of good and beauty is maybe the aroma of that ointment coming up as he's hanging there on the cross. Maybe. Right. Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what Mary has done will be told in memory of her. Hear me, 2,000 years later, we're still honoring this lady. 2,000 years later, we're still honoring this lady, Mary. Jesus' words were true. Jesus, hear me, hear me. He will always vindicate those who are devoted to him. I need you to hear this. Jesus will always vindicate those who are devoted to that are worshiping allegiance to King Jesus. They can mock you. They can chastise you. They can insult you. They can cancel you. They can barrage you with whatever. But at the end of the day, Jesus will always vindicate those who are devoted to him. Amen. He will. Right. Listen to what one of my favorite theologians, Charles Spurgeon, is why we named our second boy Jack Spurgeon Park, says about this woman. I think it's on the screen. Sometimes when your heart prompts you to go and do such and such a thing for Christ, you cannot tell what you are doing. You may be doing a very simple thing in appearance, but there may be some wonderful, some matchless meaning in it. Christ may be but sending you, as it were, to take hold of one golden link 
Maybe there are 10,000 links that are hanging to it, and when you draw out that one, all the 10,000 will come after it. This woman thought she was just anointing Christ. Nay, says Christ, she is anointing me for my burial. There was more in her act than she knew of, and there is more in the spiritual promptings of our heart than we shall ever discover to the day of judgment. So friends, you just don't know. When God calls you to do something, go somewhere, talk to someone, and you do that, you just don't know what there's that, that divine ripple effect that God wanted to use to do X, Y, Z in the future. These golden links, as Spurgeon says. So don't ever see your act of obedience, though as small as it may be, as insignificant as you never know from that little act, what ripple effect, what golden links would be set off at the same time. Amen. So if God is prompting you, if God is calling you, To do something, maybe follow that prompting. Maybe seek some wise counsel, people that you trust, and and share it with them. And I always tell people, if if 9 out of 10 people tell you that you trust, that you have a tail, you should at least look in the mirror. For my life, it's been people either affirming or not affirming things that I feel God is calling me to do including moving to Pittsburgh to start a church, okay? Now we shift from Mary's worship of Jesus to Judas' betrayal of Jesus. Verse 14 through 16. Then one of the 12, whose name was Judas Iscariot, do not name your boy Judas, just, that's a free one, went to the chief priest and said, hey, what will you give me if I deliver him to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver, and from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him, Jesus. So this, again, is the guy that whipped all the other 11 up to be like, what a waste. Give it to the poor. Um, May we not be like Judas. Most of us know Judas. Even non-Christians know Judas. When you go to dictionary.com, Judas is defined in the dictionary as traitor. Judas will always be known for as a traitor. This is how scripture remembers Judas, as a traitor. We first meet Judas, if you remember, in Matthew 10, and even there it says that Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed Jesus. So this is all that Judas will be known for as the one who betrayed Jesus. The one good thing that Judas brings to the table, it teaches us what not to be. Who not to be like. So at this point, we are back in real time from the flashback in Bethany. And we are now probably Tuesday or a little after Tuesday before the crucifixion of Jesus. So again, Jesus has been teaching. He just finished flipping tables. He just finished rebuking the religious leaders with the infamous seven woes. He just did the Olivet Discourse, which is the end times, the final judgment. And during all of those teachings, hear me, Judas was there. And Judas probably saw the look on the religious leaders' faces as Jesus was doing all of this. He probably saw the disdain and the anger in the religious leaders' faces because Judas was there. I mean, we saw last Sunday that chief priests, they plotted together in Caiaphas' palace to arrest and kill Jesus in stealth. But they were cowards, if you remember, Right? But, so hear me, these guys weren't going to go do this in public because they feared the crowds, and they didn't know where Jesus was staying in private, so essentially Judas provides a solution for them. Judas resolves this tension of, I don't want to do it in public because people like him and I don't want to uproar, and I don't know where he is in private. Enter Judas. I can solve this for you. He brings resolution to this tension for those religious leaders preparing and planning and plotting 
to arrest and murder Jesus. So Judas, hear me, he embedded himself into Jesus' inner circle. Judas is a sleeper cell the whole time. Satan connected himself into Jesus' inner circle through Judas. Judas, he was one of them. Hear me. Judas was a part of all of it. Judas witnessed the miracles of Jesus. Judas listened to the teachings of Jesus. Judas ate with Jesus. Judas hung out with Jesus. Judas sat under the teachings of Jesus. Judas preached himself. Judas was probably a great communicator. Judas, from the outside, he was one of them. And Jesus even made Judas the treasurer, the bookkeeper of his ministry. John 12 says that Judas used his position to steal from Jesus' ministry. Again, he's the one who whipped up the other 11 against the woman for wasting that ointment when it could be used for the poor. So Judas goes to the chief priest. To, to be clear, hear me, as we read this, Judas initiated all of this. The chief priests don't go looking for Judas. It reads that Judas went to the chief priest and said, if you read the passage, chief priests, they don't say a word. They just give him the 30 pieces of silver. It was Judas who went. It was Judas who spoke. It was Judas who asked. Matthew's account, they don't say a word. They just kind of give him the money and send him along his way. Again, we know that Jesus, as you know, spent a good portion of his ministry melting the faces of these top religious political leaders that consisted of the Pharisees, the fundamentals, and the Sadducees, the progressives, didn't get along, but they got along when it meant to kill Jesus, which tells you everything. So these guys, hear me, they were the higher-ups in society and every time, again, that Jesus rebuked these guys, Judas was there and probably saw the look on their faces of disdain. So Judas started scheming and planning and plotting. This was for sure premeditated. So when Judas switched team jerseys, he wasn't only shifting from good to evil, God's side to Satan's side, hear me, he was also climbing the social ladder so that he can become an influencer. Because you got to remember, a lot of these guys, Jesus guys, they were from a rural place called Galilee. So they had a Galilean accent. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so he wasn't going from God's side to Satan's side, he was also going from country to social influencer. This was the closest Judas has ever been in his life to tasting and feeling and maybe grasping political power and influence because he was in the presence of the highest political power at that time. So the question may be, so Frank, why did Judas betray Jesus? Yes, it was prophesied. Yes, I know. But from what we can gather from Scripture, Judas betrayed Jesus because he hated Jesus and he loved money. He hated Jesus and he loved money. Other than that, we don't really know. We can speculate but what I think broke the proverbial camel's back for Judas is when Jesus rebuked the disciples for not getting it with the ointment of Mary. Yes, Jesus called out all 12. But again, according to John, Judas was the instigator of all of it. So Judas probably felt the sting of that rebuke the most. And instead of humbly receiving the rebuke of Jesus, he let that stew, he let that fester, and it led to rebellion, right? Hear me, you can ride and hide your hatred for Jesus for a while, but it will reveal itself at some point. 
How do you react when you are confronted with the word of God? Do you rebel and buck up and try to change the word of God instead of changing your mind? You're closer to Judas than Jesus. Okay. Again, as Jesus' treasurer, Judas had been stealing money from the pot for a while now. Judas, he is feeling a sense of entitlement because, again, a lot of these guys, they left lucrative family businesses, left it all to follow Jesus. And Judas is thinking, hey, I gave up a lot to follow this guy. I need my cut. So he stole. Hear me. Judas did not think Jesus was worth it. He's not worth all the suffering. He's not worth all the insults. He's not worth all of this sacrifice. He's not worth any of this. So Judas regretted giving up so much to follow Judas. Hear me. Righteousness and obedience will cost you something. If, if I want to see how spiritually mature you are, uh, part of me can see, what have you given up for Jesus? What has it cost you to follow Jesus? Some of you, it's cost you nothing because you believe in this American church evangelifish lie. You don't need to give up anything. You, need to, you don't need to change anything. Because he loves you, forgives you. Yes, he does. But that love should cause you to change. Okay. The question is, do you want this deal? Suffering, insult, opposition. Some of us, you, you don't want this deal. You may be a Judas. And so here Judas, listen, used insider information to do evil. He used insider, confidential information to betray Jesus. Jesus had, not Jesus, Judas had the information on Jesus' whereabouts, where he's staying in private. Judas also knew that it would be the chief priest that would be the one to carry this out. Why? Throughout Matthew, right, you remember Jesus has been teaching and telling these disciples, hey, there will come a time where I'll be delivered up to the chief priest. So he, he's called it. So Judas knew it's going to be these guys that are going to carry this out because he's been teaching on it. He used access privilege to Jesus to do evil. He used privileged information to do evil. Do you know that you can use knowledge and truth to do good or evil? Judas, he was telling the truth. This is where Jesus is. True, but it was for evil. It was for evil. And he said, hey, what will you give me if I deliver him over to you? They paid him, again, 30 pieces of silver, and from that moment on, Judas is scheming and trying to find the right time to give him up. So again, the chief priests, if you saw, they don't have a dialogue with Jesus. They just give him the cash and they let him leave. They paid him 30 pieces, which is a month's wages. It's about $20. Some of you have that in your pocket right now. So it's not a ton of money. Technically, Judas could have negotiated for a little bit more. But this is how cheap Jesus was to Judas. Hey, what's Jesus worth to you? 20 bucks. The woman gave a year's worth of wages. Judas sold him out for a month's wage. Do you see the stark contrast here? Right. Hear me. What Judas represents for us today is to be controversial. It is compromised, cowardly pastors. Yes, this does apply to compromised Christians, but Judas was a shepherd. Judas was a leader. Judas taught the word of God. 
This is a warning about compromised, cowardly, woke pastors. Compromised pastors, compromised leaders, these guys won't honor Christ and his word because there's a fear of losing the givers and the donors in the church because they love money more than Jesus. We don't want to ruffle feathers, especially their feathers, because they're the donors. We don't want to rock the boat because we know that they really have a nice boat, and I don't want to lose that boat. That giver, we won't say it. We may imply it, we may skirt around it, but if we say it, we might lose the donor, we may lose the money, we it may damage our bottom line. Where you love money more than the people, you love money more than the word of God. Am I against money? No. Should you give? Yes. But that we will never dilute the word of God in the fear of losing people, especially donors. Here's what I'm learning. These compromised pastors, it's not what they say, it's the 50% they will not say. They believe it, but they don't believe it enough to proclaim it. They may open the Bible and be gifted communicators, but within their heart, they love money more than Jesus. I remember during COVID shutdowns, it's been really another controversial statement. I remember reading about this church who did not shut down and they were incurring fines from the government. And I remember there were some Christians, even some pastors saying, they're wasting the Lord's money. I'm like, you sound like Judas. You sound like Judas. You're wasting the ointment. You could give it to the poor. How easy, friends, it is for you and for me. I always tell people, you put me in the right situation, I am capable of anything. How easy it is for us to betray Jesus for sheep. Not even for a lot. Cheap, hear me, this is key. The reason why Judas hated this woman's worship with the alabaster jar of ointment was not that he cared for the poor. Here it is. It was because Judas could not imagine and fathom why anybody would think Jesus is worth that much. That was the issue. He couldn't fathom anybody thinking that Jesus is worth that much. 20 bucks, maybe. A year's worth of wages, that's insanity. What a waste. He could not imagine that anybody would think that Jesus would be that supreme in their life. He didn't care about the poor. So here's the question for all of us, and I pray for some of you, it cuts you. What have you given up, or what are you willing to give up for Jesus? John the Baptist gave up his head, literally. Okay. And hear me, truth be told, most of us, if not all of us, we probably will not get our head, we probably would not get decapitated for Jesus if only God would give us that honor. But for most of us, we probably will not get our heads cut off for Jesus. But hear me, maybe your promotion is cut off. Maybe your social equity is cut off. Maybe your influence is cut off. Maybe your reputation is cut off. The question is, can you be bought and what is your price? 
Can you be bought and what is your price? Because hear me, we give Judas a hard time. Oh, how dare you? How could you betray Jesus for $20 and you have betrayed him for less? For approval, you've betrayed him. For a smile on their face, you've betrayed him. Some of you, you are so deep into your sin and you don't want to get out, just like Judas. Because there's fear of being exposed. Judas never left his sin. He never left, he never repented. And it started with just a little bit of discontentment. One theologian said that sin is like a wedge. You drive into a piece of wood before you split it. I've never split wood. I've seen people do it. I've seen videos on it. I'm going to act like I do this on a daily basis. But sin is like a wedge. You drive into the piece of wood before you split it, meaning the finest point goes in first so it splits. A little discontentment. A, a, a little entitlement. A, a, a little bit of bitterness. A little bit of greed. A little bit of thanklessness. Finest point. Um, Judas, hear me friends. This is sobering for all of us. Judas is proof that you can experience the glory of Jesus right in front of your face, that you can hear Jesus talk and teach right in front of your face, you can see the miracles of Jesus right in front of your face and still be a false convert. You can go to church all of your life and still be a false convert. You can know your Bible cover to cover and still be a false convert. Judas is proof of that. It is possible to hear about Jesus every day of your life and still be a Judas. Let me end with two people in the Bible. Let me talk, talk about Judas and Peter. Let me explain why. If you look at Judas and Peter's life, they're very similar. Very similar start, similar progression, different ending. Both Judas and Peter walked with Jesus. Both Judas and Peter sat under Jesus' teaching. Both Judas and Peter betrayed Jesus. One guy is the rock on which the church is built and got crucified upside down for Jesus. The other guy hung himself in the heat and his body bloated so much that all the guts exploded on the field. Similar start, similar journey, very different endings. So what's the difference? Peter repented. Judas never repented. So, friends, hear me. The question is not, are you going to blow it with Jesus? Yes. All of us will. The question is, when you do, will you be like a Peter who quickly repents or will you be like a Judas who never repents? That's the question. The only way, hear me friends, to prevent this from happening is for all of us, if you haven't been, to be born again. All of us need to be born twice. You're born into this world. You got to be born again spiritually. You're born physically from your mother's womb, and you got to be born again spiritually. Some of you, you're not born again. You've been born and birthed, but you haven't been 
born again. And I'm pleading with you today, come to Jesus, come to the cross, ask for mercy, repent of your sin like Peter so you don't end up like a Judas. Because Judas never repented. And we know how his life ended. Peter repented and we know how gloriously his life ended. And we're still talking about him today. So friends, the question is, how much is Jesus worth to you? Ben, you can come up now. How much is Jesus worth to you? Again, every Sunday, I, I hope the gospel is preached. I hope salvation is offered. But before you get saved, you, you got to know what you're getting saved from. Before you accept forgiveness, you got to know what you're being forgiven of. Right. So my fear as your pastor, and thank you for letting me be your pastor, and thank you for letting me open up the Bible every Sunday, my fear is that some of you, you're here, and you're not born again. That you would sell out Jesus if everything is lined up. That Jesus is not worth what he was worth to Mary, that you're like the disciples saying, what a waste. He's not worth that much. Yes, he is. And I don't know what that proverbial alabaster jar is for you, but the question still remains, what is Jesus worth to you? Is he worth your life? Is he worth your reputation? Is he worth your influence? Is he worth, God forbid, your relationships? Is he worth any of those things? Please reject this stupid American church lie that righteousness, obedience, following Jesus will cost you nothing. It will cost you everything. And whatever you lose, it's all gain. As Paul says, I count it all as loss for the future glory that is beholding me. And not trying to be dramatic, but I say this often. Friends, the way the culture is trending, there needs to be more resolved, passionate, I don't care what people think, worship and allegiance to King Jesus. I share this illustration often from C.S. Lewis that if everybody is running off of a cliff and the one dude running in the other direction, he's considered the psycho one. May we be the psychos. May we be the ones running in the other direction as we passionately worship and pursue Jesus and give everything to Jesus and pour it all out to Jesus and be fully devoted to Jesus, all eyes on Jesus, all affections on Jesus, everything in us on Jesus because he is worth it. Like Mary. In the world's eyes, it's foolish. In God's eyes, it was a golden link connected to a thousand other golden links. And we're still talking about and honoring this lady named Mary today at Tove Church in 2024. Amen. Don't don't you want that on your tombstone? Don't you want to be remembered like that from your great, great, great grandkids? 
Grandpa Frank wasn't perfect, but man, he loved Jesus. That was very clear. He loved the Lord. He was devoted to the Lord. Not in my notes, but I'll share it. We are coming up on football season. I've gotten text about this. I don't care. We have people that put more effort and fervor and passion to a dead piece of pig crossing a line for a measly six points than for the kingdom of God. Am I against football? No, watch it. I don't care. Calm down. I'll end with this, and I've shared this before. I remember when Mari and I, we, when we moved here, 2019, and we didn't go to church for six months. It was hard. But I remember going to the strip district. I remember walking around. I remember seeing everybody in Steeler gear. And I also remember dad just decked out in Steeler gear. And I saw his little boy also decked out in Steeler gear. And I guarantee some of those boys, they, they've never been to a Steelers game before, ever. They, they've never met any of the players. They have maybe even never seen an actual game. But why are they decked out? <laughs> Dad loves the Steelers. I mean, he, he stops everything on Sunday for the Steelers. Everything is set out for the Steelers. And when they lose, dad just gets very grumpy. And when they win, he's just so happy. Like dad loves the Steelers and I love my dad and I want to be just like my dad. So I want to be just as into the Steelers as my dad. All the time. We're from Ohio. I was in Ohio for four years. Same with the Buckeyes. It's this functional Jesus that your kids see that this is the most important thing to my dad and my dad is the most important person to me and I want to be just like my dad so I'm into the Steelers too. Dad loves Jesus. Dad adores, this is a word to you men, Dad adores Jesus. Dad actually lifts his hands in worship to Jesus. Dad takes us to church together and leads the way instead of mom to worship Jesus. Dad is all about Jesus, and I love my dad. I want to be just like my dad, so I want to be about Jesus too. You see how that works. Mom is like Mary. She just is so devoted to Jesus. May it be true for us. Watch your football games. Put the jersey. I don't care. You know where I'm getting at. But may it never trump Jesus. If you need to miss church for a game, something's off. Something's off. That when our children look at us, when our grandchildren look at us, they would see a legacy of men and women who are devoted, pour everything out to Jesus. They weren't perfect, but man, they love the Lord, and when they messed up, they repented quickly, knowing that they are forgiven quickly. That's what I want. For me and my family, I want that for you and your family. And again, men, it starts with you. It starts with you. I love you. 
Some of you need to be born again. Some of you are closer to Judas than to Jesus. Some of you have been faking it for a while. Let me pray. Um, Take a moment. Head down, eyes closed. And let me ask you this question again. What are you willing to give up for Jesus? Is he worth it? What is the proverbial alabaster flask of ointment to you? What do you arrogantly think is yours that's not yours? Do you need to be born again? I'd love to pray with you and talk to you. May Jesus be worth what he was worth to Mary. And hear me, you can say it verbally as much as you want, but really the proof is in the pudding. And for Mary, it was her entire retirement gone in one moment, not knowing that that was really preparing him for the burial of her Savior, Jesus. And maybe again, the one whiff of joy that Jesus got from the cross was the aroma of that ointment that was slathered on Jesus lavishly. Some of you are entitled. You think it all is about you and it belongs to you. And you've worked too hard. Hear me, Mary poured out everything. And Jesus on the cross literally poured out everything. Holy Spirit, speak to us this morning. Um, May we not be a Judas. May we not be the one who sees you as worth just $20 to be sold out. May you be worth what you are worth in Mary's eyes as we honor her today, 2,000 years later. God, I pray as we read and talk about Judas that we would not think, look at him, but we would see this as a sober warning for us. To ask ourselves a very honest, sobering question, have we sold him out for less? And what does repentance look like? Lord, we want to be worshipers of you who worship you lavishly with every area of our life. That it wouldn't just be profession of words. It would be possession of our hands that show us that we value you, Jesus, above everything else. You are king. You are Lord. You are top. Nothing above you, nothing before you. And the Holy Spirit, I pray, would you show us ways that we can do that in our lives? Practically, not just with our lips. That maybe people will come to us and think that we are crazy thinking he's worth that much to you? Yes, he is. He is. 
So Jesus, thank you for the cross and thank you that you, days later, would pour out your blood and your sweat and your tears for the salvation of us all. We are forever grateful. And so in response, we pour out our praise to you. We pour out our lives to you. Because you deserve it and you are absolutely worth it. We love you, Jesus, and we pray this in your good name. All of God's people said, amen. Let's stand, church, and let's worship lavishly King Jesus.